There once was a desolate forest. The first man to live in the Thomas area was named Jacob Pace. He and his family moved into a log cabin on a hill in 1880. The town was named for Thomas Davis, brother of Senator Henry G. Davis. In 1884, the West Virginia Central and Pittsburgh Railway came to Thomas. It came for the coal mining, which began in 1883. As the mines were opening, more and more people came and large mills began to cut down the surrounding forests for lumber. The Thomas Mine was called Mine Number 23 by the West Virginia Central Railway Company when it first opened, but they weren't impressed by the output of coal and ended up closing it in 1885. In 1836, the Davises took possession of the mine and opened a new one about a mile away in Coketon. They built two coke ovens for the purpose of testing the coking qualities of the coal. They were satisfied, so in 1888 the company of Davis Brothers and Elkins was born. They expanded this into the Davis Coal and Coke Company in 1889. In 1893, several companies like Davis Coal and Coke, Davis and Elkins, Fairfax Coal and Coke, and Henry Coal and Coke merged into the Davis Coal and Coke Company to form just one large company. In 1894, they also absorbed the Jefferson Coal and Coke Company. At that time, about 1,300 men were employed and monthly payroll was about $70,000. Numerous people of different nationalities came to work in the mines, many of which were African American. As the railroad was built in the region, black railroad men remained behind to work in the coal mines. Later, more blacks came directly for the mines. Coal companies actively recruited black workers, but many encouraged black, uh, their friends and family to join them in the coal mines. During the Great Depression, the percentages in the state's coal mining labor force dropped from more than 22% in 1930 to about 17% in 1940. The Depression and World War II also unleashed new technologies and social forces that transformed the coal industry and stimulated massive outmigration in the post-war years. Mine management always put the first loading machines where blacks were working, meaning that black miners were the first to lose their jobs. With the declining population, racism became more present. By the late 20th century, African American miners had dropped to less than 3% of the workforce, and as blacks lost coal mining jobs, they found alternative employment opportunities. While they worked for the mines, blacks lived among the other immigrant workers, but they still had segregation in the churches and schools. Carrie Williams was a school teacher in a one-room colored schoolhouse in Coketon, West Virginia. She led a landmark case for civil rights. When she refused to sign a contract saying the school year for black students could only be five months, while the school year for white students could go for eight months. She continued teaching for eight months without pay for three months because she did not want to sign a contract denying her students three months of learning. J.R. Clifford was the attorney to defend her case at the Tucker County Courthouse. Clifford expressed how the contract was illegal because black students were not getting an equal education. Mayer and his lawyer Streeby argued that there are less blacks in the community so they are paying less taxes and five months of schooling is all they could afford. The jury, under the Honorable Judge Hoke, decided that the contract was unlawful and Mrs. Williams should receive the whole amount of $120 for the three months she taught without payment, and that she could teach for as many months as the white students. The man who won this case was the big dogs in terms of early civil rights for African Americans. In 1848, John Robert Clifford was born in a barn in Williamsport, Virginia to parents Isaac and S.M. Kent Clifford, who were freed slaves. When J.R. was 10, he was sent to Chicago for school. Then at age 15, he enlisted in the Civil War in which he served in the Company F 13th Regiment of the U.S. Heavy Artillery United States Colored Troops. He then went to a writing school in Wheeling and began to teach other African Americans to write. In 1875, he graduated from Stoyer College and became a teacher at Sumner School in Martinsburg, West Virginia. 
1882, he published the first Pioneer Press, which was the first African-American newspaper. In 1887, he became the first African-American in West Virginia to pass the bar exam. In 1896, he was the lawyer for the Martin v. Morgan County Board of Education. He was then later a charter member of the American Negro Academy. And then he was the lawyer for the Carrie Williams case versus the Tucker County Board of Education. Then in 1906, he worked with the Niagara Movement at the Sawyer College in Harpers Ferry. Then in October 6, 1933, he died in Martinsburg at the age of 85 after falling down a flight of stairs at his house. He was buried at Mount Hope Cemetery in Martinsburg, West Virginia. Then later in 1954, he was reburied in Arlington National Cemetery. This was a landmark case as it was one of the first to give African Americans a legal right of equality that led to the war on inequality. Although they still had a long way to go and a large fight ahead to stand up with the Jim Crow law and the KKK, as well as court cases like Plessy v. Ferguson, which continued a tradition of hidden inequality of facilities. They stood their ground and through the Brown versus Board of Education case, the 15th Amendment, and the laws to give them equal opportunities, they prevailed to provide more equality for all. This small court case for the, for the brave Carrie Williams to get equal education for her students was the start to the fight for the truth of the words all men and women are created.